I welcome uh, brothers and sisters and friends wherever you are tuned in to our presentation. And uh, I just want to say God is good and we are seeing his mercies continue to sustain us and uh, to continue guiding us as we close up this earth's uh, history. And so I'll, I'll welcome you to this uh, nightly presentation on uh, the financial crisis that uh, the world is facing right now in the coming labor unions. It is something that uh, is taking us by storm, but uh, we have been told in the scriptures, these things must need to happen and then the end shall come. Uh, but uh, as they happen, they have to be accompanied by the everlasting gospel to warn the world to be prepared for the tremendous things that have to happen to this world. So uh, I'd like us to look at uh, some few things. Always we say some few things, and then uh, uh, actually as we present, uh, there is uh, some information that the Lord reveals unto us so that uh, we are not only limited to the notes that we are having, but uh, whatsoever the Holy Spirit will like to reveal unto us necessary for our preparation and our salvation. I'd like us to pray and then... Uh, we can fully enter into the presentation of today. Uh, gracious Father in heaven, glory and honor be unto thy name. There is nothing we can do but that which we are guided by thee. And Lord, as we look uh, into what uh, is inspired to transpire in these last days, Help us to comprehend what you are speaking to the churches and to each one of us in the families around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, I'm glad that uh, the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Not uh, that uh, I claim the prophetic gift, but simply what it says that uh, uh, the Lord will uh, reveal uh, his thoughts to the church through his people, whether it be the clergy or uh, whether it be the laity, whoever is uh, prepared to listen to the voice of the Lord, the Lord will uh, I use them to speak his truth to the people so that uh, nothing may get them unaware. And uh, they may be prepared. They may prepare their family. They may prepare their neighbors. And everyone must hear what is coming to happen to this world so that they may not say that I never knew about this. And uh, if we are having any information, and then uh, our colleagues, our family members, our neighbors do not know about these things, then uh, let us rethink again because we have been set upon on Zion's wall as watchmen. And that is why uh, as we see the demonstrations going around the world, we see the banks failing and um, the urge to go for the digital current and the control of the markets. What, what are these things really speaking unto us? And that is what I want to look. And uh, I'd like to tell you that uh, I'll be quoting from uh, the Bible. I'll be quoting from uh, E.G. White. And also I'll be quoting from uh, the book called The Creature from the Jekyll Island by Edward G. Griffins. And so if you don't have that uh, reach out unto me, I'll be able to give you a link so that uh, you may purchase the book. Um, uh, it is somehow copyrighted, I think, and so that uh, you may be able to share some information from it after uh, getting authorization. Now, the Bible explicitly tells us um, in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verses 7, that uh, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is a servant to the lender or to the lender. And that is uh, what is happening around the world. And they, there's a lot of dependence uh, on these financial institutions. And we are being told that the rich ruleth over the poor 
and uh, the borrower is a servant or a slave to the uh, um, the borrower is uh, a slave to the lender and so this is the kind of uh, situation that the lord will want us to get out of from that we may not be a servant or a slave to anyone but we may be his servants and his slaves working out righteousness in this world um also we are told of uh, being financial stable and having rural homes secluded places where we can grow our own food so that uh, we may be able to live as kings and queens when the crisis breaks during the little time of trouble before we just enter into the great time of trouble. Also, we know uh, the clay kingdom in Daniel chapter two will be that kingdom where actually we move from them, those metals that are precious in Daniel chapter two from gold, silver, bronze, and then we reach at uh, the clay part, whereas you know that uh, clay is not something really that can be trusted as a, a precious uh, a stone compared to uh, or a precious thing compared to gold I, I think you see that declination of uh, the those metals as you go through the book of uh, Daniel chapter 2 not only in Daniel chapter 2 but um, when you come to the book of James chapter 5 we are told that a uh, whole or uh, the rich men, because your gold and the silver is conquered and you have heaped them for the last days. And so we know that uh, there will be a, mono a monopoly of uh, financial muscles in the end time that uh, money shall be really in the hands of the few, the rich who shall hold it for the end times. And that is the scenario in the book of James chapter five. And we are told that when you see these things happening, a look up and be patient and establish your heart for the coming of Christ is near, even at the doors. Behold how the farmer waited for the former rain and the latter rain, and the judge standeth at the door. That is what we are told in James. And this um, collapse of the finances will cause a revolution. You see that. Uh, the people are um, really taking to the streets in the book of James. There is revolution and the people are crying out for their wages, which has been withheld by them whom they worked for. And then their cry reaches to the Lord of Sabaoth in the book of James chapter 5. And so you are expecting a, a revolution happening in the book of James chapter 5. When you reach to the seals in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 6, you find that uh, a measure of wheat and um, for a penny and then do not hurt the oil. You, you, you see the balance is there. And we are told that even though these seeds have been in the history, actually history shall uh, repeat itself. Old controversies shall be revived and new controversies uh, shall arise. And so uh, we are looking at all the aspects and the corners of uh, the Bible to see what does the Lord have for us in the time that we are living in. And then in Revelation chapter 13, when the second beast rises to, to the power and starts speaking like the dragon, there's no buying and selling, which means that there's the control of commerce and the financial institutions so that if you do not have the mark of the beast, you cannot buy and sell. And that is where we are headed in these um, um, digital currencies where actually uh, they can switch off your line anytime and you cannot access your money. And uh, another thing that you have to know, they have to monitor what you buy and how much you buy and in the quantities that you are buying them. And so uh, there's a period that you can't go beyond buying this and the period you can't go beyond uh, spending this and that. And that is revealed in the book of Revelation chapter 13. And so we are living in uh, a tremendous times, brothers and sisters, where we are seeing all the prophecies that has been written in the Bible really uh, dawning on us. And uh, it, it seems that uh, these things are um, happening to us unaware. We are not uh, spiritually, our eyes are not spiritually open to see what is happening. And so um, there's some, um, something that I have to share with you on these things and uh, 
when uh, you look at um, the book of education, page 228, paragraph two, we are told at the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine, but human. The centralized the centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of many, the combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interest and claims, the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teaching that led to the French Revolution, all are tending to involve the whole world in struggle similar to that which convulsed France. And so, what we are seeing that uh, these things will culminate in what brought about the French Revolution. And uh, sometimes we have to go beyond what we are seeing on the streets, what we are hearing in the um, in the in the media and the news agencies, and uh, keep behind these people who are speaking. And so who is speaking through them? Whom are they representing? And are they giving the right information or are they giving false information? And that is why I, I told you that uh, I'll be looking or quoting from the book, uh, The Creature from the Jekyll Island by Edward G. Griffins. Now, I want us to go through some history, uh, which is so interesting, by the way, if you have never read this book. And uh, Edward G. Griffins, has something to say. How can the bank's managers continue in cons cons conscience to fund such as genocide doll uh, regimes? We wonder what is happening on the streets and uh, we wonder what is all about this revolution. Yes, people are hungry, people need food, there's no finances, the dollars is failing, but what is really happening? And you have to re remember the the Jesuit agenda number 37, the, the, the weakening of the nations that uh, they shall cause bloodshed, revolutions, and the rioting on the streets by uh, causing inflation and recession. And so we look in the background, what is really happening that is leading to this bloodshed that we are having in different countries in Africa and the other parts of the world. How can the banks managers continue in conscience to fund such a genocidal regimes? Part of the answer is that they are not permitted to have a conscience. David Dunn, head of the bank's, uh, head of the bank's Ethiopia desk explained, political distinctions are not something our charter allows to take into account. And then number two, the greater part of the answer, however, is that all socialist regimes have the potential for genocide and the bank is um, committed to socialism. George Bernard Shaw, one of the early leaders of the Fabian socialist movement expressed it this way, under socialism, you will not be allowed to be poor. You will be forcibly fed, clothed, lodged, taught and employed whether you liked it or not. If it were discovered that you had no character and industry enough to be worth all this trouble, you might possibly be executed in a kindly manner. But while you are permitted to live, you will have to live well. Edward G. Griffin's The Creature from the Jekyll Islands. And um, you, you have heard this phrase every now and then that you will own nothing and then you will be happy. And this is exactly what is happening because the chaos you are seeing right now in Africa, both in the Northern Africa, in the Eastern Africa, and in the Southern Africa, think about it for a moment. That... Uh, this chaos you are seeing, they are not happening in the middle countries of Africa, but they are happening in the coastal regions uh, where actually we have the in inlets of uh, the, the ships coming from other countries and uh, the end reports uh, from other countries where actually if there is instability in these regions, there is no goods coming in and there's nothing going out because these riots render business really not be able to proceed. And so we are seeing all these places being affected, both the Northern region where we have the merchandise coming in from the East uh, and from the, the Northern part. And then we have having the Eastern Africa being destabilized also with these things that are happening. 
And so there's no business per se going on and the tourists are not now coming in so that they may be able to bring in the, the, the resources. And we are seeing the Southern part also that there are demonstrations, which means that these things are going to continue and it is like they have selected pivotal points where the, uh, the Africans really get uh, their uh, mechanisms from so that uh, you are having like uh, the trade of Africa is being controlled in a way of uh, a political scenario. And uh, if you have not opened your eyes, then you have to open your eyes and see what is happening. And these people are happy with what um, uh, they are doing per se. Their main aim is to destabilize the nations as uh, we are seeing it uh, happen. Now, uh, Thus, uh, the saga continues after pouring billions of dollars into undeveloped, underdeveloped countries around the globe, no development has taken place. In fact, we have seen just the opposite. Most countries are worse off than before the saviors of the world got to them. Look at um, the billions that have been poured in Kenya. It is a shame that Kenyans really are coming to a point they own nothing in their own country. And it's not only Africa, but also other countries in Africa and other nations outside Africa. It is like billions and trillions have been poured in these countries until the people in those countries do not own anything, even their own houses. And the taxes are accruing every day so that the people are coming to a place they cannot afford the taxes. They cannot afford to live on their own properties, which seems the, the, the properties are not their own because when the taxes are being uh, levied and you can't afford them, we are told that all the land belongs to the government. Thanks to God that in Kenya, it's not happening that rapid, but in other nations, you can see that uh, everything is going to the government. Now, this is nothing new. This is nothing new per se. Think about, the hunger that was in Egypt. And uh, the people ate all they had. And then they started selling their own lands uh, to the government until they came to a point they owned nothing and the government owned everything. This is the scenario that is repeating itself as we speak right now that uh, it is coming at a point that uh, a citizen will own nothing, even what was his own, he will not uh, own it. And this they have made so, so that the life is so difficult and uh, the people will rely on them rather than uh, uh, develop themselves. And so they are pouring billions and trillions in countries to develop them. But as they pour these finances, you are not seeing what is happening. You find that uh, they have decided to build this and this, and then uh, they'll be taxing the people of that country until their money is recovered. But um, there's something that you have to understand with finances. Countries cannot repay loans. All they can do is service those loans. And whenever a country, and Edward G. Griffins goes into this in a, a very deep way, whenever a country reaches at a point that they are about to finish their loans, actually, there is always a financial trouble or an inflation and recession of the things that are coming from outside that country, inside that country. Like you find there are many things that we don't manufacture in Kenya. Say that we are about to finish the loan of China or whichever country you may want to name. Just about when we are about to finish it, you find that there is a financial trouble. And then there is inflation and there, are, there is a recession of anything coming from outside, inside the country, then you find that even the dollar has gone up so that the money that you could have repaid that loan with, actually you find that you cannot pay it because there is nothing you are selling, there is nothing that is coming in and there is nothing that is going out. And so what you will have just to do at the end of the day, it is, it is to service the loan and not repay the loan. And this is what is happening uh, even in this country, as we speak right now, that we cannot pay our debts because the dollar right now, 
the way it was when we took the loan, it is not the way it is right now as we speak. There's a time the dollar was 80 Kenya shillings, but now we are talking about the dollar being 132 Kenyan shillings. Tell me how you can pay the debts that you are having because when you took the loan, that was not the value of the dollar, but now it has increased. It means more printing of the paper money. And the more you print the paper money, the more the money loses its value. And so let us continue with the Edward G. Griffins and see what he says in this book, The Creature from the Jekyll Island. He says, capital for the IMF and the World Bank comes from the industrialized nations, with the United States putting up the most. Funds consist partly of hard currencies, such as the dollar, yen, mang, or franc, but these are augmented by many times that amount in the form of credits. These are merely promises by the member governments to get the money from their taxpayers if the bank gets into trouble with it is uh, loans. And uh, I think uh, I went so much. Um, he continues to say that. Um, while the IMF is gradually evolving into a central bank for the world, the World Bank is serving as it is lending arm. As such, it has become the engine for transferring wealth from the industrialized nations to the un underdeveloped countries. While this has lowered the economic level of the donating countries, it has not raised the level of the recipients. The money has simply disappeared down the drain of political corruption and waste. Now, you have to ask yourself, what are you seeing in Kenya right now? It is a political uh, uh, maneuvering among us, uh, 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 between the government and the opposition party. And you have to look in the background, really, what is happening, rather than looking at these politicians really assembling in church on Sundays. And after the preachers give the word of God, the politicians uh, the politicians really take the pulpit to press their agenda, which is like, uh, 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 um, what do I say, enlisting uh, their supporters in their agenda, which is not according to the word of God. I don't know how the clergy have entered into this trick of allowing politicians to take the pulpits after the sermons. God forbid that this is happening in this country and God forbid that it's happening in the world, we have to stand against what is happening. Politicians should go into their offices and parliaments to make laws and sell their agendas, not to come to churches and be given pulpits after the sermon to uh, uh, pass their agendas, which ends in bloodshed. And we are very responsible as clergymen and the laymen for allowing these politicians to take the pulpit as if the, it is a political uh, office. And uh, one day we'll answer to God very soon when Christ comes in the clouds of the air. Um, by, 18, by 1989, inflation was, um, we are told that inflation was um, running at an average of 5,000%. And in the sum of that year, topped at a million percent. Banks were offering interest rates of 600 percent per month in hopes of what? In hopes of keeping deposits from being moved out of the country. People were rioting in the streets for food. Is, isn't that what is happening? What was happening in 1989 is it's the same thing that is happening as we speak right now. There has been no change. We have been fooled that there was a financial crisis in 2008. There was no financial crisis in 2008. What started way beyond in 1989 has been just happening. It is put at a stop for a season, and then it is it's again revived. It's like uh, we are watching a movie which has episodes. And so when this episode comes to an end, there is a pause as the telecasts go into the background to uh, review how the last episode was and improve on it or make it even more worse. As Christians, we have to understand these things because when uh, we are with our friends, we hear them make uh, speeches, we hear them take sides, or 
this is this and this is that, this is this and this is that. But uh, they don't understand something that whatever we are seeing right now, it was prophesied in the Bible that um, there will be a few men trying to put the finances together and mobilize riots and mobilize revolutions so that they may bring in a solution, which may something that may seem a solution, which is a desis antidesis thing, that uh, the people may at last be dependent on them and not be self-independent. And uh, I was trying to go through a conversation with her, a conversation that one person was having with another person. And what, what were these people quarreling about? What was what were they abusing each other about? It started as a conversation and it ended in uh, the two uh, uh, men abusing each other. One man was saying that um, the, the leader of this politi political party said that he will give us jobs when he enters into the president. And that is our president, uh, 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 William Ruto, that uh, he will give us jobs as uh, university graduates. The other man was telling him, you see, young man, if you are waiting for the government to give you a job, you better think about it. There is nothing wrong with the president. The president said he'll create jobs. What are you doing as he tries to do that to make sure that um, you are not dependent on the president or on the government? Now, I, I don't really get into political issues. I don't do politics. But as I was going through this dialogue with these two people, uh, I found out that uh, we are in a crisis because if a young man from the university is waiting for a, a, a job to be employed, a white collar job, then he doesn't understand what really education at the end of the day means. Education is to empower you to have the skills of survival, not to be dependent. And what our young man has been brainwashed with is a life of dependence. Let us say that the government cannot uh, really give white collar jobs. Does it mean that is the end of those who have graduated in the universities? Far be it that a parent can pay so large monies in the university and what you can come from from that university is to depend on somebody. I, I think we, uh, our youths need to start thinking anew on these things. And so, we are seeing that um, in 1989, what started in 1989 is what is repeating itself. It's like an episode where they act, they pause it, and we go into the background. So people were rioting in the streets for food, and the government was blaming greedy shop owners for raising prices. The nation was hopelessly in debt with no way to repay. Brazil is run by the military, and the state controls the economy. Government-owned companies consume 65% of all industrial investment, which means that the private sector is limited to 35%. And what is happening? It is shrinking. The government used loans from US banks to create an oil company uh, that is per Petroleo Brasileiro uh, SA, which became Latin America's largest corporation. Despite huge oil deposits and record high oil prices, the company operated at a loss and was not even able to produce enough gasoline for its own citizens. By 1990, inflation was running at 5,000%. Since 1960, it is, uh, prices had risen to 164,000 times their original level. A new crime was invented called hedging against inflation. And people were arrested for charging the free market price for their goods and for using dollars or gold as money. Led by communist organizers, mobs from the streets shouting, we are hungry. I, I want you to think what is happening in Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Tunisia, Liberia, and all those countries, Nigeria, we are talking about Africa, but I can assure you that these things will come to happen in other countries. Led by communist organizers, mobs from the street shouting, we are hungry. Right now we are, we are, we are running about with the, the pants on our head and the superiors talking about unga or pla that we don't have it. It's no different with what was happening in Brazil. And it was orchestrated by billions and millions being poured in that country and then having inflation and recession. And so the people could not afford anything. 
at the same time, they were owning nothing. Still what you will, the nation was hopelessly in debt with no way to repay. Uh, Edward G. Griffins continues, after receiving more than $3 billion in loans, it nationalized the nation's homes and industries and converted every business into a government agency. It built a truck assembly plant, a tire factory, electronic factories, highway ports, railways, and dams. Tanzania's industrial production and agricultural output fell by almost one third. Food was the main export in 1966. Under socialism, food had to be imported, paid for by foreign aid and more loans from the World Bank. The country is hopelessly in debt with no way to repay. We are seeing what is happening in countries like Brazil. We are seeing what is happening in Tanzania in those years. And right now we are talking about what is happening in this country, Kenya, what is happening in Daniel chapter 2, James chapter 5, Revelation 6, and Revelation chapter 13. Again, Argentina once had one of the highest standards of living in Latin America. But then it became the recipient of massive loans from the World Bank, as well as commercial banks in the United States. Since the money was given to politicians, it was used to build the only system politicians know how to build, socialism. By 1982, the gross national product was in a nosedive. Manufacturing had fallen to less than half of capacity. Thousands of privately owned companies had been forced into bankruptcy. Unemployment was soaring, and so was welfare. The experience in Mexico was a carbon copy of that in Brazil. Now we go to Mexico, except that the amount of money was larger. When the world's fourth largest oil reserves were discovered, Mexican politicians reached for the brass ring. With billions borrowed from US banks, they launched Petroleos, Mexicanos, Femex, and soon became the world's fifth largest oil producer. They also built chemical plants and railroads and launched many other industrial projects. These were run as welfare agencies instead of businesses. Too many people on the payroll, too many managers, excessive salaries, too many holidays, and unrealistic benefits. The ventures floundered and lost money. Private businesses failed by the thousands and unemployment rose. The government increased the minimum wage, causing more business to fail and more unemployment. That led to more welfare and unemployment benefits. To pay for that, the government borrowed even more and began creating its own fiat money. Inflation destroyed what was left of the economy. Price controls were next. And this is what we are talking about the labor unions. When they come into place, you cannot buy or sell if you are not part of these labor unions, and that is what is in Revelation chapter 13. So prices controls were next, along with rent and food subsidies and doubling the minimum wages. Of late, have you heard about subsidizes in Kenya? There are so many. President William Ruto has tried doing away with some, but he won't be able to face these things because he is facing a huge giant in the house in the name of donors, in the name of investors, in the names of uh, those who had invested in the country and now they want back what they had invested in it. And what will he do? Nothing he can do. I, I can assure you the riots we are seeing right now cannot solve the problem we are having in this country, Kenya. Never. We have to think again how we are going to solve our own problems, not going to the streets, but uh, using our brains, to use the reins that are now in Kenya to do something so that at the end of the day, we may place something on the table. You cannot place riots on the table at the end of the day. You go rioting, you come back hungry in your house and you have a family, you have children. They, they don't know that you have gone to riot. They need food. Use your brain, use your hand, use your legs to do something at this point when the rains are falling on the ground so that uh, when the people are harvesting, you are not a beggar on the street. Right now you are rioting for food. When people are harvesting, either you will be a thief or you will be a beggar on the same street. And so by 1982, Mexicans were trading their pesos for dollars and sending their savings out of the country as the peso became all but worthless in commerce and Kenyan shilling is becoming worthless. 
There's a time that uh, the Kenyan shilling had contained the dollar at 80 shillings per dollar. But right now we moved from 80 to 90, then 100, 116. And God forbid we are going to see the dollar triple by the end of this year. And uh, if uh, you own a million shillings in the bank, you know what you'll be owning at the end of this year if the dollar triples, you will only be having 200,000 out of the million that you're having in a bank. Think about that for a moment again. By 1982, Mexicans were trading their pesos for dollars and sending their savings out of the country as the peso became all but worthless in commerce. In 1981, the average wage for the Mexican workers was 31% of the average work for Americans. By 1989, it had fallen to 10%. Mexico, once one of the major food exporters in the world, was now required to import millions of dollars worth of food grains. This required still more money. And what next? Um, more money and uh, more loans. All this occurred while oil prices were high and production was booming. A few years later, when oil prices fell, the failures and shortfalls became even more dramatic. In 1995, Mexico's bank loans were once again on the brink of default, and once again, US taxpayers were thrown into the breach by Congress to cover more than uh, $30 billion at risk. Although this loan was eventually repaid, um, the money to do so was extracted from the Mexican people through another round of massive inflation, which plunged their standard of living even lower. Massive. We continue. The nation is now hopelessly mad in socialism. The Communist Party promising reform and still more socialism is attracting a large following and could become a potent of political force. We are looking at the history, and then we shall enter into the labor unions, what this history means to us. In India, the World Bank funded the construction of dam that displaced 2 million people, flooded 360 square miles, and wiped out 80,000 acres of forest cover. In Brazil, it spent a billion dollars to develop a part of the Amazon basin to fund a series of hydroelectric projects. It resulted in the deforestation of an area half the size of Great Britain, and has caused great human suffering because of resettlement. In Kenya, think about it. Now you, you are in your own country. This is Sammy Wilberforce. In Kenya, the Bura irrigation scheme caused such a desolation that a fifth of the native population abandoned the land. The cost was how much? $50,000 per family served. In Indonesia, the trans migration program mentioned previously has devastated tropical forests at, um, at uh, the same time that the World Bank is funding reforestation projects. The cost of resettling one family is $7,000, which is about 10 times the Indonesian per capita income. Per capita income, yes. Livestock projects in Botswana led to the destruction of grazing land and the death of thousands of migratory animals. This resulted in the inability of the natives to obtain food by hunting, forcing them into dependence on the government for survival. While Nigeria and Argentina are drowning in debt, billions from the World Bank have gone into building lavish new capital cities to house government agencies and the ruling elite. In Zaire, Mexico and Philippines, political leaders became billionaires while receiving World Bank loans on behalf of their nations. In the Central African Republic, IMF and the World Bank loans were used to stage a coronation for its emperor. Now, the record of corruption and waste is endless. We can go on and on with these things, but the real eye opener is in the failure of socialist ventures, those magnificent projects which were to bring prosperity to the underdeveloped countries. Here are just a few uh, examples that um, we have really been given what is happening around this one. Now, it is interesting when you read uh, the history of uh, the World Bank and AMF that what is uh, given as the money to really develop the countries 
our political agendas to strengthen those whom they themselves know of. And so since this game results in a hemorrhage of wealth from industrialized nations, their economies are doomed to be brought down further and further, a process that has been going on uh, since time memorial. The result will be what? A severe lowering of their living standards and their de demise as independent nations so that they may become dependent nations. You, you know, we talk about colonial rule and um, we deceive ourselves that colonial rule is over. We are being colonized from the outside. The troops of the foreign nations are no longer there, but then their money and projects are there, which can be withdrawn anytime they want, and then there is starvation. Instead of using the resources available to empower our own people to do something with their own hands, it is like massive projects and corporations are being formed and the people are educated to have these white collar jobs in these corporations. And then when these corporations are swept away or taken away, thousands and millions become unemployed. If they were using their own hands to create jobs for themselves with the skills and the knowledge that they receive in true education, then we will not have a nation having young men and young women rioting on the streets that they need to be employed to have white collar jobs. You know, the problem doesn't even start with those who are crying for white collar jobs. The problem starts with the education we have been sold to. There is a certain education that uh, we have bought from people which doesn't work for us at all. The kind of education where you are uh, instructed in the things that the country cannot afford for itself. And so you have to depend on another country establishing something in your own country to give you a job. And when this other nation moves, it is cooperation from your country, then the education you receive has nothing to offer you because that kind of job you are trained to, to do has been taken away from your nation. If you are trained according to the education, according to the resources found in your country, then even if a nation decided to pull out of your own country, you, you will still be employed. So what you are experiencing is economic hemorrhage that cannot be solved with the kind of education and the kind of uh, the systems that we have put in place. We have to overhaul everything. We don't have just to oust the president. As people plan to oust the president, they, they should be thinking twice. This is not about ousting a president. This is about really uh, doing an overhaul of everything, right there from uh, our educational system and uh, infrastructures and all these things so that uh, we may work with the minimal resources we have, but be satisfied with them. And so the hidden reality behind the so-called development loans is that uh, these uh, developed countries and uh, industrialized uh, nations are being subverted by that process. And uh, it is not an accident that we are facing, actually. It is a deliberate economic sabotage. A strong nation is not likely to surrender its sovereignty. They, they can pull out their armies, but uh, uh, really will have a, 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 a hole hanging in your own country. And so the systems we are seeing put in place, there are systems to, at the end of the day, cause chaos rather than cause solutions to our problems, and not only in Africa, but uh, other nations. But um, what is the final play in all this? What is the final play, play in, those, in, in, in all this stuff that uh, we are talking about? Uh, I like to, uh, bring something that um, it is interesting from uh, the creature from Jekyll Islands by Edward G. Griffins. This is the final play that uh, we, we are talking about. The underdeveloped nations, on the other hand, are not being raised up. 
What is happening to them is that their political leaders are becoming addicted to the IMF cash flow and will be unable to break the habit. These countries are being conquered by money instead of arms. Soon they will no longer be truly independent nations. They are becoming mere components in the system of world socialism planned by Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes. Their leaders are being groomed to become potentates in a new high-tech feudalism, paying homage to their lords in the New York, and they are eager to do it in return for privilege and power within the new world order. That is the final play. The essence of socialism is restribution of the wealth, and that has been really voiced since 2008 that uh, let us control the markets, let us share the wealth that we have, let be their equal distribution of uh, what people are having. The goal is equality, and that means taking from the rich and giving to the poor. At least that is the theory that we are having, and that is the theory they are selling to the people. Unfortunately, the poor are never benefited by this maneuver. They either do not get the money in the first place, too much is siphoned off by the bureaucracies which administer the programs, or if they do get any of it, they don't know what to do with it. They merely spend it until it is gone, and what then? And then no one has any money except, of course, those who administer the government programs. Nevertheless, politicians know that promises to redistribute the wealth are popular among two groups, the voters who naively believe it will help the poor and the socialist managers who see it as a job security. Supported by these two voting blocks, election to office is assured. The rules of bail out. Now we have what we call the bails out from what we are having in the crisis. In fact, uh, I know that the next move in this country, Kenya, is a bailout from the chaos that we are having. It's not even a handshake that we are talking about. It is not um, about people sitting on the table and uh, uh, seeing how they can revive the economy and do the right thing. No. The rule of the game is bailout. Every now and then when we are having a financial stress in any nation which is underdeveloped, the only rule for that nation, so as it may not go into fringe revolution before the time reaches, it is a bailout. And what are the rules of uh, bailout? Maybe we can look uh, at them as uh, we look at uh, the financial crisis and the looming uh, labor unions. The rules of bailout, as even you are seeing the banks fail and uh, everything going down the drain, commercial banks in the industrialized nations, backed by their respective central banks, create money out of nothing and lend it to the governments of underdeveloped nations. They know that these are risky loans, so they charge an interest rate that is high enough to compensate. It is more than what they expect to receive in the long run. Number two, when the Underdeveloped nations cannot pay the interest of their loans. The IMF and World Bank enter the game as both players and referees. Using additional money created out of nothing by the central banks of their member nations, they advance development loans to the governments which now have enough to pay the interest on the original loans with enough left over for their own political purposes. Number three, the recipient country quickly exhausts the new supply of money and the play returns to point number two, lending, having the loans again. This time, however, the new loans are guaranteed by the World Bank and the central banks of the industrialized nations. Now that the risk of default is removed, the commercial banks agree to reduce the interest to the point anticipated at the beginning. The data governments resume payment. So you will never be allowed to finish your loan. This is the rule of the game. It's like a chess, and even a chess game has its end. This is, uh, I don't know which game I can liken into what the banks are playing. Now, Christians have to understand what I'm speaking because at the end of the day, we have been told in Proverbs chapter 22 that the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is a slave or a servant to the lender. And the Lord will want us to come out of this system, which is bloody in itself, causing revolution and chaos and riots on the street at the end of the day. And so 
rule, the, the bailout rule number four, the final play is, well, in this version of the game, there appears to be no final play because the plan is to keep the game going forever. To make that possible, certain things must happen that are very final indeed. They include the conversion of the IMF into a world central bank as Keynes had planned, which then issues an international fiat money. Once that bank issue is in place, what happens? The IMF can collect unlimited resources from the citizens of the world through the hidden tax called inflation. You know, we are talking of the things that uh, maybe you have to be a financial uh, uh, degree holder uh, to be able to understand. No, you don't need a degree to understand what is happening in this country and in other countries. What you need is to study your Bible and see what happened in Egypt. And not only in Egypt, I want to introduce you to a story in the Bible, by the way. We may talk so much and forget about the Bible. And uh, I want to take you uh, to the Bible because uh, The Bible doesn't lie. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter five, I want you to take your Bible and read because this is the gist of the matter. This is where we are headed. Nehemiah chapter five. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jewish. For there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Now, remember what Satan boasts in the prophets and kings. For want of food and clothing, the whole world will be under my control. And so these people are complaining for in verse two, for there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters are many, therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also, there were that said, we have mortgaged our lands. Think about that, mortgaging your land so that you may eat and live. And after mortgage, mortgaging your land, you have nowhere to farm and uh, you can't sustain yourself. You can't be independent. You are dependent at that point. Whenever a man, has no place to till and get his own food, then he is dependent. No wonder, before God created Adam, he made sure that there was a garden of Eden where he can work and get his food. Don't start forgetting this story in the book of Genesis because this is what the Lord will want us to be in financial freedom, having a place where we can get our own food, which is not contaminated with this GMO and all this stuff that we are getting in this country. We need a place to get our own food. And so they are saying in verse three, Nehemiah chapter five, verses three, some also there were that said, we have mortgaged our lands, vineyards and houses that we might buy corn because of the death. There were also that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and our vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought, brought out unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. Now, I don't know how many people have read, read about mortgage in Nehemiah chapter 5 and how it happened. Exactly what is happening. So if Christians can find themselves in such a scenario in that they can't even have obedience to God because of the death that is happening, what will happen to us when everything is taken from us? And, uh, you know, we don't have to go through the time of trouble before the time of trouble comes. Some, of, some people are saying, oh, we are suffering for God. No, we are not suffering for God. We are suffering because we have rejected to use our brains. We have gotten an education which is dependent and we will have jobs which are dependent and we will have everything which is dependent. 
it is a time we freed ourselves from all these dependent things and have a system which is self-independent. And so um, what next? There is a possibility that there is no country which still belongs to its citizens, but all countries belong to IMF and World Bank. This is a, a very, uh, 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 this is something to think about. This is something to think about. L listen to this. There is a possibility that there is no country which still belongs to its citizens, but all countries belong to IMF and World Bank. All the big cities you see and the buildings in them, you think that people are developing their own country when they are in loans and uh, they can't pay the loans. And so somebody else is owning them, but the names, the, 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 the name of the person who is the owner of the building is different and the one who owns the, that person is different. It is very true that when a loanee fails to pay the debt, what he owns becomes an asset, surety or collateral. This one, no one disagrees. Yet, when we say the countries who have defaulted to pay their loans, their properties becomes the asset, surety or collateral of IMF and World Bank, there is shouts of what? Conspiracy theory. But I'm unraveling you the plan of financial system towards the forming of trade unions that will at last control the buying and selling and plunge the whole world into distressful moments. And what Edward G. Griffin is saying is a reality. When you go to a bank today, brothers and sisters, and you take a loan, what do they really tell you? What are you having as an asset? What are you having as um, a surety, a guarantee in, a, in the case that you can pay your loan? You will say, oh, I have a sewing machine. I have uh, a cow. I have a... Uh, a land and I have a title deed and all that. And they tell you, okay, then bring the title deed or uh, bring um, the, um, the receipt of your bullock or bring the receipt of your sewing machine. And it becomes a collateral. Now, when we as a country go to borrow a loan, what do we have for surety? What essentially we have is that, uh, okay, we are borrowing a loan for what? For Kenya. So what we mean is that uh, Kenya is in your hand if uh, we do not pay this loan. And that is exactly what is there. We, we may shout conspiracy theories. We may shout these words like, oh, you are a fool and all that. that but that is what we are. You can hide your face as much as you can as the ostrich, put it in the sand. But uh, when you take it out of the sand, it will be more worse than when the time you put it in the sand. You, we have to face the reality of what is happening. And so these labor unions that are coming, these sabotages of financial systems and the labor unions that are coming, and uh, we are right about to the brink of Revelation chapter 13 playing itself. Why, why is it so much important to have talk about these things? We need our hearts to be established. When, uh, before I read this, uh, when uh, you go to the book of uh, James chapter 5, when these things are happening, this is what we are told in the book of James chapter five. I'll read from verse one. When all these things are happening, financial instability, riots, and all these revolutions. James chapter five, verses one say, go to now ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is conquered. Right now the dollar is nothing. The Kenyan shilling is nothing. Everything concerning finances is nothing. And the rest, the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the high of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which as of you kept by, by fraud, cried and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. He have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Now, when all these things are happening, look at verse 5 to verse 9, what the Lord tells the Christians. Be patient, therefore, verse 7, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. The second coming, behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long wait or patience for it, until he receives what? 
the early and the latter rain, as it's in the literal, on the natural, so it's in the spiritual. Be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now, look at the two brothers who are today abusing each other on this issue of uh, the government and the opposition leader and the financial constraints that we are having. The Bible says, grudge not against each other. Now, in, in, in which situation are these two brethren? Are they not holding a grudge against each other? Another one calling the other some names, how he is foolish and all these things, how he's uneducated and all this stuff. And the Bible is saying, grudge not against other, each other because the judge standeth at the door. The door of what? The door of closing of probation and the second coming is nigh. We are told that as the silver and the gold are conquered and the revolutions are happening, as a Christian, establish your heart and be as a farmer who waited for the early and the latter rain. Behold, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, grudge not against each other because the judge standeth at the door. He is not still seated, he is standing. And uh, we can hear the footsteps of the high priest coming out of the sanctuary as it were in the day of atonement. Are we ready for the coming out of the high priest from the heavenly sanctuary above? We know that when uh, he comes out, there is no mediation going on. And if we sin after this, actually we have to carry our own sins. Think about uh, such a things. And so uh, we are told this conflict, what is it headed unto? It is to plunge the whole world into distressful moments. Now, in letter 26, 1903, let us hear more about uh, inspiration after doing some history back, background. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them with blinding force. In the world, gigantic monopolies will be formed, as that one we have read in the book of uh, James chapter 5, where actually people are heaping up gold and silver for the last days. Men will bind themselves together in unions that will wrap them in the folds of the enemy. A few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines of business. Trade unions will be formed, and those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. Labor unions and a source of uh, trouble for Adventists. The trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as has not been seen the world began. We are talking about Daniel chapter 12, verses 1, when Michael stands up and there will be a time of trouble as never has been seen the nation. A few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines of business. Trade unions will be formed and those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. Because of these unions and confederacies, it will soon be very difficult for our institutions to carry on their work in the cities. My warning is keep out of the cities, build no sanitariums in the cities. This is uh, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 142. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. Same book page 141 and relieving page 11 these unions are one of the signs of the last days men are binding up in bundles ready to be burned they may be church members but while they belong to these unions they cannot possibly keep the commandments of god for to belong to these unions means to disregard the entire decalogue and how will you be disregarding the entire decalogue because this system is not based on the love of God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and the love of the neighbor as you love yourself. We are told in, uh, uh, we are told in uh, uh, a letter 26, 1903, written to brother and uh, sister J.A. Baden, December 10, 1902. The forming of this union is one of Satan's last efforts. God calls upon his people to get out of the cities, isolating themselves from the world. The time will come when they will have to do this. God will care for those who love him and keep his commandment. And so 
Uh, I'd like to say this. Let it be repeated that governments have no money and so can't pay any debts they accrue. So here is the IMF to give your country of maybe 50 or 30 million, a loan of 1 billion. What next? The parliamentarians discusses the projects to be done with half of that uh, money, while the rest is used for skyboating. And uh, operating that country is increased by either two shillings, the oil is increased by five shillings, and the sugar is increased by 10 shillings. The taxpayer is paying a loan that he never knows it is smell where it has gone. They get these millions, they put a certain amount in the projects, and then they put in the pockets the other, and then they increase the commodities to a certain amount, and then you start repaying the loan. In five months, that debt is paid by the, but the government continues collecting their increased product money for another five months. They complete the projects, not with the IMF money, but the taxpayers' money. This is what is called, in reality, legal fraud and robbery without violence. And that is why God has established another government with a different and opposite principle to the world governments, because we are being told to join these unions will be to disregard the whole decalogue. And so Edward G. Griffins has uh, something to say in this line. And uh, I'll quote him once again. Whenever government sets out to manipulate the money supply, regardless of the intelligent or good intentions of those who attempt to direct the process, the result is inflation, economic chaos, and political up, uh, upville, upheaval. By contrast, whenever government is limited in its monetary power to only the maintenance of forced nest weights and measures of precious metals, the result is price stability, economic prosperity, and political tranquility. Therefore, for a nation to enjoy economic prosperity and political tranquility, the monetary power of its politicians must be limited solely to the maintenance of honest ways and measures of precious metals. Edward G. Griffins, the creature from the Jekyll Islands. Now, uh, Proverbs 14.34, righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When you go to Leviticus 19, 35 to 36, you shall do no wrong in judgment, in measurement of weight or capacity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just him. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When you start having these false measures and creating inflation and recession, you are against the whole decalogue and whoever involves themselves in such a financial maneuvering, you can be sure that uh, sin is written against your name. In Ezekiel 45.10, you shall have just balance, a just effort and a just bar. You think about it, is the money that is being bought, the gasoline, the right money? Is the money that is being bought the flood, the right money, and all these commodities you can name off, these are unjust efforts. And uh, we cannot say that the nations have run out of resources. No, somebody's doing something somewhere. Proverbs 20.10, it says, different weights and different measures, both of them are abominable to the Lord. Proverbs 11, verse 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 16, 11, a just balance and scales belongs to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are his concern. Proverbs 20, verse 23, differing weights are an abomination to the Lord and a false scale is not good. Hosea chapter 12, verses uh, 6 to 7, we are told, therefore return to your God, observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually a merchant in whose hands are false balances he loves to oppress. Amos chapter 8, verses 4 to 8. Hear this, you who tremble the needy. Do away with the humble of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain uh, and the Sabbath that, and the Sabbath that uh, we may open the wheat markets to make the bushel smaller, and the shekel bigger, and to cheat with dishonest scales. 
so as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals, and that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. 90, page 89, paragraph one, as we bring this to a close, there is coming a rapid and surely an almost universal guilt upon the inhabitants of the cities because of the steady increase of determined wickedness. We are living in the midst of an epidemic crime at which thoughtful, God-fearing men everywhere stand aghast. The corruption that prevails is beyond the power of the human pen to describe. Every day brings fresh revelations of political strife, bribery, and fraud. Every day brings it is heart sickening record of violence and lawlessness, of indifference to human suffering, of brutal, fiendish destruction of human life. Every day testifies to the increase of insanity, murder, and suicide. What best can describe the country of Kenya right now, the country of South Africa? and the other nations in the part of uh, North Africa. Through the working of trust and the results of labor unions and strikes, the conditions of life in the cities are constantly becoming more and more difficult. 90 page, uh, this is testimonies to the churches, volume nine, page 90, paragraph two. And then page 90, paragraph three, the intense passion for money getting, the thirst for display, the luxury and extravagant, all are forces that with the great mass of mankind, are turning the mind from life's true purpose. They are opening the door to a thousand evils. Many absorbed in their interest in worldly treasures become insensible to the claims of God and the needs of their fellow men. They regard their wealth as means of glorifying self. They add house to house and land to land. They fill their homes with luxury while all about them are human beings in misery and crime in disease and death. Again, paragraph four, by every species of oppression and extortion, men are piling up colossal fortunes while the cries of starving humanity are coming up before God. There are multitudes struggling with poverty, compelled to labor hard for small wages, unable to secure the barest necessities of life. Toil and deprivation with no hope of better things make their burden heavy. When pain and sickness are added, the burden is almost unbearable. Care worn and oppressed, they know not where to turn for relief. And so in 91.1, the scripture describes the condition of the world just before Christ's second coming. James, the apostle, pictures the greed and oppression that will prevail. He says, go to now, ye rich men, ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the high of the laborers who have ripped down your fields, which of you kept back by fraud cried, and the cries of them which have ripped are entered in the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. And this is the condition of the world as um, I'm speaking right now and the condition of this country. This is a picture of what exists today. Judgment is turned away and backward. And justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. Yet truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself afraid. That is Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14 and 15. So what are the solutions of these things? We are told, while all this is happening, there is something also that is happening in the churches. And uh, this is uh, the point that I want to finish with. As you see all this scandalous scheming of different nations, as I said in the beginning, the clergy and the churches have no strength left in them because they are the ones who have given their pulpits for this political enlisting of uh, uh, of uh, of their supporters because they go to these churches after the sermon, they are given the pulpits and they start speaking whatever they speak and the emotions are charged and the atmosphere is charged also. And the people, instead of uh, being blessed by the word of God and going home, they leave the church charged with hellish ideas. 
And instead of seeking the Lord on their knees in prayer, all they can go is on the street. Even the church, which will be the pillar and ground of the truth, is found encouraging a selfish love of pleasure. When money is raised for religious purposes, what means do many churches resort to bazaars, suppers, fund fairs, even to lotteries and like devices? Often the place set apart for God's worship is discredited by feasting and drinking, buying, selling, and merrymaking. Respect for the house of God and reverence for his worship are lessened in the minds of the youth. The barriers, the barriers of self restraint are weakened. Selfishness, appetite, the love of display are appealed to and they strengthen as they are indulged. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 91, paragraph 3. So in the anti deluvian world, human agencies brought in all manner of devices and ingenious practices to make of no effect the law of Jehovah. They cast aside his authority because it interfered with their schemes. As in the days before the flood, so now the time is right upon us when the Lord must reveal his omnipotent power. In this time of prevailing iniquity, we may know that the last great crisis is at hand when defiance against God's laws is almost universal. When his people are oppressed and afflicted by the fellow men, the Lord will interpose. Satan is not asleep. He is wide awake to make of no effect the sure word of prophecy. With skill and deceptive power, he is working to counteract the work, the expressed will of God made plain in his word. For years, Satan has been gaining control of human minds through subtle sophistries that he has devised to take the place of the truth. In this time of peril, right doers in the fear of God will glorify his name by repeating the words of David. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Psalms 119, verse 126. And so, um, in uh, the development of this uh, plural well described by Governor, uh, Governor Morris, the former delegate from New York who had helped to draft the constitution into final form. He had been an assistant to Robert Morris, not related, and was a champion of this, the concept of natural aristocracy. So he knew this subject well when he won. The rich will strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest. They always did. They always will they will have the same effect here as elsewhere if we do not, by such a government, keep them within their proper spheres. We should remember that the people never act from reason alone. The rich will take advantage of their passions and make this the instruments for oppressing them. The result of the contest will be a violent aristocracy or a more violent despotism written in July, to 1787 in a letter to James Madison, quoted in uh, Prosperity Economics by W. Cleon Spusen, Free Man Digest, February 1985, page 9. So, we are told in Luke chapter 21, verse 26, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the glory with the power and uh, great glory. And so the solution to all this is to go back to God's own plan, to go back to all God's plan. And uh, what is God's plan? Proverbs 28, 19. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain person shall have poverty enough. And what you are seeing in this country and in other countries is the people are not tilling the land. The people are not ready to use their hand, but um, they are following after vain persons. And what shall be their result? Poverty. And the church need to do better than also go to the streets 
and riot. We are told every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists is to be the, to the world what Joseph was in Egypt and what Daniel and his fellow fellows were in Babylon. And uh, in uh, Adventist home, page 374, independent of one kind is praiseworthy. To desire to bear your own weight and not to eat the bread of dependent is right. It is a noble, generous ambition that dictates the wish to be self-supporting. Industrious habits and frugality are necessary in this time that we are living in. You ought to be careful that your expenses do not exceed your income. Bind about your one, so we are told. And so we are in the final crisis. And uh, whatever we do, let us make sure that we are on the side of the Lord. Lastly, in Desire of Ages, page 121, paragraph 3, the last quote we are reading, Desire of Ages, page, 160, page 121, paragraph 3, we are told, in the last great conflict of the Conrovers with, with Saturn, those who are loyal to God will see even earthly support cut off. So why need to riot even? Why need to go to the streets? Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will be finally decreed that they shall be put to death. Revelation 13, 11 to 17. But to the obedient is given to the, the promise. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be munitions of rock. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Isaiah 33, 16. By this promise, the children of God will live. When the earth shall be wasted with famine, they shall be fed. They shall not be ashamed in their evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Psalms 37, 19. To what time of distress the prophet Habakkuk looked forward, and his words expressed the faith of the church. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be on the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I'll rejoice in the Lord, I'll joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk 3, 17, 18. And uh, this is my prayer that um, as we see all this political maneuvering and financial scheming, we have to give our hearts to the Lord because these are indicators of the last day events. And we are headed into labor unions where we may not buy and sell. And uh, whatever we have been told to do, let us do it. La let us love to use our hands. Let us not wait for those white collar jobs. Let us uh, be a people who can be counted on and a people who can uh, drive in the minds of others, even who are not Christian, something positive rather than what we are seeing right now. And so may the Lord bless us and uh, may we consider about these things. And if they are so true, let us try to reach as many as we can and uh, remove this mentality that uh, we were created to be given something by the government, to be uh, uh, dependent on them. Let us come out of this dependent mindset and become independent. At the end of the day, we have to depend on Christ alone, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Shall we pray? Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, you need uh, a different lifestyle from your church and from Christians to those of the world who have no knowledge of what is happening. Help us, Lord, to come to the truth and that that truth may set us free because we are in bondage. My people perish because they lack knowledge. And uh, as the world is in turmoil of what uh, is happening around it, help us as uh, the children who profess to know the truth to be able to preach that truth and to liberate those who are in slavery. And so thank you for this uh, presentation and thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. May you cause us to know the times that you are living in and give us the strength to go through them. In the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, I pray these things. Amen. May God bless you. And uh, if uh, you need the materials, of uh, the presentation, be free to uh,
contact me and uh, I'll be able to email you the material. God bless.